All right, thank you. Saloons, alcohol, and the old west, you know, you can't, they're probably one of the biggest cliches in Hollywood westerns. But unlike um, some other Hollywood cliches about the old west, this one was real. Uh, next. Okay, when the cowboys came off the trail, or they were coming, or they were done, you know, working their chores at the ranch, they would come to town. The first thing they would do, often after they got paid, they would go get a shave, a haircut, which you don't see in the movies, and take a bath, and then they would head to their local watering hole. And, which probably were not as nice or as clean or neat as this, but there was, you know, women, first ones they've probably seen in months, months, alcohol, and other diversions, shall we say, poker there in the table, and so forth. Okay. Now, I want to talk a little bit about economics first so you can appreciate some of the stuff you're talking about. On a cow drive, um, trail boss may have 100 to 20 dollars a month, um, 2700 to 3300 dollars a day. Occasionally they got bonuses, the cook, and you know, Hollywood cliche cooks are clowns. Not really. The better your cook was, the better the cr trail crew you got. They made 60 bucks, and all others 40 bucks a month. And they were paid on the end of the trail after the herd were sold, and most drives lasted two or three months. So basically, you're talking these guys came into town with eighty to one hundred and twenty dollars in net money. Okay. The ranch cowboys made twenty-five dollars a month. Although they also got room and board, and they worked fifteen hours a day, and they were young men. And cowboys lasted only two or three years before finding other jobs because. It was a tough job. Now, Calvary soldiers are dead to the slide, but a private in the Army made $13 a month. After deductions, it came up to about $9.50. But one thing, too, that hurt the buying power of all these people was the fact that they got paid in paper money. Most, a lot of people would not accept it at what we call par or face value. They would maybe, you know, 50 cents on the dollar if, or less. So, of course, one of the first things they would do after the shower and the shave is they look for a bar. And, like in a boom town, you have this Keystone Hall, suspected, started by someone who was from Pennsylvania. Next. Or you have one here, probably by an Irishman, the Shamrock Saloon. Pretty basic, simple building there. I love this name of this one, Holy Moses. <laughs> <laughs> and the saloon, I guess that's the owner, and he looks pretty respectable. And judging from the scene, this was probably a, a you know, you know, gold mine, you know, boom town. Yeah, you often would find them pop up there too. And then you got some that just simply say saloon. That was now yeah, towns that were more established, like Denver or Dodge City. You would have brick ones that were there. Um, this one I love the name, Devil's Peril Saloon. Now, one of the things the saloons will also offer besides alcohol would be lunch. Um, this one here, I found the saloon, had a 25-cent meal. Some would offer a free lunch with the idea that you would have to drink up and they would make the money off, off the profits. And it was quite profitable being a saloon owner. Uh, beer cost 10 cents a glass. A shot of whiskey cost 25 cents a, a shot. And when you consider that a cake of whiskey, depending on the quality, costs three or four dollars, you're talking some serious, Ooh. serious money off of just selling whiskey. And keep in mind, okay, these guys are making 25, you know, by 25 cents. Some of them are making $25 a month. Ten, ten shots of whiskey, their paycheck is gone. So, free lunch and the cheap lunch was quite popular. Um, in the interiors, you have all kinds. This is Probably a Boomtown one. You see, you got two kegs and a board there. And then you got one a little bit more slightly upscale. Um, I love that guy's jacket with the checkers and mean looking cuss right there behind the counter. You know, you see the bottles there with a uh, whiskey. Okay. And this one's a little bit more. Um, this looks like it might have been, judging from their outfits, a little bit more towards the mm -hmm. north and a little bit more. Looks like it might be a Boomtown one as well, but a little bit more firm. And again, the bottles in the back. Now this is probably what you would find in one of the major cities like San Francisco, Denver, whatever. And you notice the, what I call the girly pictures on the top. 
Uh, all the bottles, you see the glasses there, and these are, I said, probably more of an urban area, judging from the guys here. And of course, a very fancy bar in the back. Uh, about 10 years ago, when we went to um, Savannah to take pictures for Carnival Destruction, um, we went into an antique warehouse near the motel we were staying at, and they had bars similar to this, um, some that were almost in the length of that back wall there. Oh, yeah. and Amazing. And prices range from five to six digits. There were a couple there that were more expensive than my house. <laughs> beautifully, you know, hand car wood mirror, beautiful. And again, one of the things about this, it shows that, hey, I'm a rich proprietor and I run a very posh place. And of course, the fancier the place is, even to this day, the fancier the place is, the more you want to go to it. And the more you're going to spend. Yeah, the more you're going to spend. Um, this would be a get more of a gambling den than a saloon. And I really like this picture for several reasons. One, you got a roulette with tech wheel right there. Um, you know, card games were always popular at saloons, but next to card games, roulette was probably the most common form of gambling. You look there, girly pictures. Um, um, well, go back. Oh, sorry. Yeah. First time we've done this one. Okay. Go, um, here you see a young African American boy. It looks like a rag. He was probably polishing the brass wellings and stuff. And one thing you also see a, you know, a little Franklin stove there. There's a couple of the options. Should point out some of the other ones too. And this I find interesting because you look at this guy right here. He's got a badge on his coat, which makes me want to go, hmm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And also knows too, some stag heads up there. So yeah, this has been more of the high end, okay. Um, this is one of the, my favorite ones. This is the St. James Hotel. If anybody's been in Boy Scouts, the Philmont Scout Ranch in Cimarron, New Mexico. This is located around the outskirts of it. It was built in the 1870s by Henry Lambert, who claimed to be the personal chef for U.S. Grant. Um, there is some, someone did some research a few years ago and found that, well, it is possible he had cooked for Grant but there's no hard evidence that he actually did. Um, it has been beautifully restored, and that's even bar. Um, besides the fact it's by Philmont, and incidentally, Philmont is where Wiley Ford, I mean, where, we're talking about Will Rogers early out there, that's the last place Will Rogers stayed in the Commonwealth of the United States. From there, he went to Alaska, where he died in the plane crash. Um, now, another reason why I like it, this is one of the most haunted, it may be the most haunted building in all of New Mexico. Um, five people left their feet first. Um, there have been numerous reports of ghosts. Billy Kidd, by the way, stayed here. And you can't really see it, the ceiling that well in this picture, but there are numerous bullets all throughout the ceiling from where people shot up things. Okay. Now, since we're talking about Texas, we have to talk about the most famous saloon in Texas, <laughs> the Texas Lily. Um, Home of Judge Roy Bean, the law west of the Pecos. You don't believe me? Just look at his sign. Mm -hmm. um, the Jersey Lily was named after Lily Lime Tree, who was a popular singer and actress of the, in the 1800s. There's a lot of legends about her and the judge. Unfortunately, they never met. However, there are some who believe that Lime Tree may have been the inspiration for um, the woman, Irene Adler, the Sherlock Holmes tale. Um, Bean got opened up his tavern, and because he was the closest thing to an honest man the Texas Rangers could find, they started bringing people to his bar for him to try. And that's his legal book. He held court with a pistol, which he used the bottom half, you know, as the gavel. Um, Bean was a master um, salesman. He would often um, have, a, you know, a recess to sell beer to, to both the plaintiffs <laughs> and the defendants. Um, as you see, beer guy equal billing with the law. Um, and he also was a master of improvision. Um, if he, there was a law he didn't like in the law book, he immediately repealed it. <laughs> His, there are several cases we could talk about. Um, one of my personal favorites is um, he was being a coroner and he found a body that had a $5 bill and a pistol. So he immediately opened the court in session and fined the body $5 for carrying a concealed weapon. <laughs> there are a couple other stories not so PC I could tell but um, yeah um, this is one where the legend and the man are actually pretty, pretty darn close to being one and the same alright tell them about beer I love this picture of the cowboys drinking beer 
Um, beer was a very popular beverage. It was, I'd say, a cheap drunk. Incidentally, saloon, by the way, I mentioned to you, comes from the French word salon, which means living room. Okay, next. All right, a little bit of science. Malt is what you're going to be talking about a lot. Roasted fermented grain, usually barley. Um, you used to make beer and whiskey. A lot of people call beer and whiskey liquid bread. In fact, there's a story about one um, whiskey manufacturer who didn't design the recipe. So basically, he took the recipe, converted his recipes into loaves of bread, made seven loaves of bread, ate all piece of each one, and said, oh, okay, this bread loaf tastes the best, and that became his whiskey recipe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Um, Don't even try to pronounce it. Yeah, I'm not going to pronounce it, but basically the oldest law in the world is the German beer purity law that says beer must be barley, hops, and water, and actually yeast, which is why I'm going to talk about the implication of that today. All right, but anyway, it's still in effect. Ales were the most popular style of beer in America in the early 19th century. Rip Van Winkle fell asleep for 20 years after drinking a keg of ale. It came in a variety of colors and strength and had a larger shelf life and lagers. Ales, the fermentation takes place at the top of the keg there. Um, the only ale that's really now you can find that was around back then is Bass, which was the biggest selling beer in the world at the time. It was a personal favorite of this guy, Buffalo Bill Cody, a man who certainly knew how to hold his beer and his liquor and probably everything else in between. Um, supposedly, there is also a case of uh, Bass Ale on board the Titanic. Right. Lagers. Now, that's what we drink now today in America. I'll explain in a second. Uh, brew at low temperatures, relatively short life. So you had to do it in really cold climates, which is why they were big in Germany and Northern Europe. And traditional lagers were dark. The fermentation takes place at the bottom. Uh, Lager actually comes from a German word that means to lay. All right. Um, Ewing is the oldest brewery in America. And Sam Adams is not, is of course relatively new. However, the formula they use is a pre-prohibition recipe for lager. So that's probably the closest you can find to what they would drink back then. Okay. Now, there's a subcategory of lager called Pilsner Lager named after the town of Pilsen in the Czech Republic. In 1842, uh, they used technology, came up with a golden lager that um, had a longer shelf life, and Pilsner Urkel was a creation. You can find it fairly easy today. Well, let's fast forward to the 1870s, and this guy, Adolphus Busch, a German immigrant, moves to St. Louis, marries the daughter of a brewer named Anheuser, Anheuser Busch, Busch, and he decides that he wants to create a national beer because at the time most beers were local or regional. So he comes up with a recipe that involves using beechwood chips, which basically is slats of wood and it's about the size of a yardstick. And then he puts rice in it, which makes it a little bit more blander. And the result was Budweiser. And to make it national, he said built ice houses all across the country, taking advantage of the expanding railroad lines. And then a few years later, he added pasteurization to extend the, the life. Now, Budweiser literally means beer from Bud. There's a town in the Czech Republic called Bud, which, by the way, has been making their own Budweiser longer than this Budweiser, which has resulted in numerous lawsuits between the two over the years, and why in many parts of Europe, Budweiser can only be sold as Bud. But because Bud also has rice in it, it violates the German law, so it cannot be sold in Germany. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, the other brewer from this era is uh, Adolf Coors, um, who bought a brewery in Golden, Colorado, and Coors came up with Coors beer, uh, which was popular out west. Of course, in the 1970s, it became really popular nationwide as sort of a cult product. Of course, the first smoking bandit film was about them bringing Coors to the East Coast because you can only buy in the West Coast. Of course, now it's national. Um, Schlitz, hmm, that one's darker than I thought. Um, well, it's one of the most popular beers at West. In fact, at one time, it was the most popular beer in America. The beer that made Milwaukee famous. Is it dark on that screen? No, it's, uh, darker, it's, no, darker, than, it's darker than what's on that. Okay, go back to that one. Uh, yeah, I have to redo that one later. Anyway, Schlitz, Joseph Schlitz founded the brewery, and by the time the Old West was going, he already sold out. But the people who took over camp with the most brilliant marketing scheme I've ever heard of. 
Uh, they simply went out and built their own saloons, and which featured Slits. So Slits was one of the most popular beers in the West for that, and a couple of the um, Slits-built saloons still exist in the Midwest. Um, I could see another one that was unique to California was steam beer. Um, they did not have refrigeration, so they did what they called the open fermentation method. Um, and the, how they got the name steam is subject to debate. Some say it's because of the equipment. Some say it's because the tubs made a hissing noise that sounded like steam. Some say that they, when they opened the windows to release the pressure, it looked like steam was coming out of the window. Um, steam beer really was not that popular or that good, although there were 70 steam breweries at one point. By 1965, Anchor was the last one, and it was about to go under until Fritz Maytag, an heir to the Maytag formula, who happened to like it, um, found out it was about to go under. He sold some of his trust fund and stock and bought the company and turned it around. He took brewing lessons, and he also improved the formula, and many people consider Anchor to be the father of the modern microbrewery, craft brewery industry. All right, wine was not big out west, but except for one exception, Champagne. Um, by international law, Champagne can only be made in the Champagne district of France. However, the United States never signed that treaty, so that's why you find all these American-made Champagnes. The French were not happy about that, by the way. Um, it's a bit of Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, and Chardonnay grapes. I should mention too in France, wines are designated by the region they come from, not like here in America where it's by the grape. The juice is fermented twice, and it's a really good year they have been this year. Now the cheap ones you see like Andre or Cook's is done by the Charmont Bolt method, a 20th century process. Long story short, it's basically like taking a ball of grape juice and inserting um, carbonation into it. It's really what it amounts to. It's a cheap process, makes a lot of champagne cheaply, but unfortunately the taste is cheap. Now champagne was popular with in the West because of the dance hall girls who would, uh, you know, would lure, hey, cowboy, want to buy me some champagne? <laughs> and of course, me and them would say yes, and so they would drink champagne. Uh, and more often than not, the women had probably deals with the bartender or the bar owner where there was some money exchanged back and forth between them. And of course, for a few extra bucks, you could get some, shall we say, some personal services from them. But that's and The most famous picture of Champagne in the West is this here, the Transcontinental Railroad at Promissory Point. You can see that they're sharing a bottle of champagne between two of them. Uh, I've read someone said that uh, what you don't see in this picture is that after it was taken, it became one big drunken party. <laughs> they are. Yeah, they are. Okay, a little more science. Going to talk about um, liquors. Liquors are basically all pretty much the same way. You would make the mash or fermentation, whatever you're going to do, in a tank, heated to boiling. The steam goes through a tube and then is recaptured here and at the bottom. And that is what is the rehydrated steam is what becomes the beverage. And you use copper because it, it removes all the impurities and makes it safe to drink. Okay, brandy was not a drink of choice by cowboys, but it was one that many of them were probably familiar with. Okay. Um, brandy is a still grape wine, um, aged in oak barrels. It takes 10 gallons of wine to make one gallon of brandy. A lot of, which is why a lot of wine snobs hate brandy. Brandy, by the way, comes from a Dutch term which means burnt wine. It originated in France and some say in monasteries. Now it's produced everywhere, but at the time France was pretty much it. And there are several grain varieties. The more you pay, the better the quality. There are some that go for thousands of dollars. Okay. Now this is an actual army medical kit from the 1800s. And you'll notice what the biggest thing in there is, a bottle of brandy. Um, brandy was used for quite a lot for medicinal purposes. So even a cowboy who would probably not even drink brandy under normal circumstances probably had a taste of it once or twice. Um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, before he became the creator of Sherlock Holmes, was a medical man, so he understood the use of brandy in medicinal purposes, which may explain why Dr. Watson in at least 14 of the 60 Sherlock Holmes stories gives 
next one of the clients than Brandy. As um, one writer calls it, Brandy was Watson's cure-all. <laughs> uh, Brandy is rich in antitoxin and polyphenols, which increase immunity. Uh, it was used as a cardiac stimulant, a sedative, which it still is today, help people sleep, and also used to treat hypothermia, and also people use it to make cook in cooking. And whiskey. I love that picture. <laughs> American with blended. Start uh, by modern law, still at less than ninety-five percent alcohol by volume or one ninety proof. And by the way, if you think these are complicated, you should have seen them before I add them down. These twelve. Um, permanent mass must be fifty-one percent of any type of grain. So, and store period two years in new chart oak containers, and then store in oak containers forty percent a proof. So far. Um, Kessler was started by a Hungarian immigrant in the 1870s. Uh, he, or he started it in Colorado and made a quite a lot of money out of it and eventually retired rich. Um, you can still find it today. It's the only American blended whiskey I know of that is has roots to the 1800s. Seagram 7 is the most popular one today, but it came out in the 1930s. Bourbon. Well, that's old Bourbon County from where it's made. Uh, it was made in the 18th century, but it's not like today's bourbon. Um, we're not as, as picky as the French. You don't have to make bourbon in Bourbon County or even in Kentucky to make it anywhere in the country. It has to be 51% corn, new charred oak containers, again, and 80% proof, and cannot have any color and flavor or other spirits. Now, there's some debate as who was the founder of bourbon. Um, some say Evan Williams, who was a merchant. But I can't Evan Williams, that should be... Uh, yeah, I can't Evan Williams twice. That should be Elijah... Um, Elijah Craig, that you can change that. Um, a minister um, was uh, the inventor. The more likely one is Dr. James Crow, but the evidence in supporting Crow is uh, that's circumstantial. And the fact is, we probably will never know. Um, old Crow... You always heard the story, you know, if I knew what Grant drank, I would give him a every general barrel of it. Old Crow was that. However, the Old Crow, and was also a favorite of John Wayne. However, the Old Crow you buy today is not the same as it was then. They changed the formula in the 80s. Um, Jim Bean, they claim, you know, six <coughs> generations of bourbon maker. That's probably closer to what you got today. Okay. Canadian. Uh, which have probably been drunk you know, along the U.S. Canadian border. It's a blend using corn, space, and, and rye, mostly made in Canada. It can contain flavoring, and it's light and smoother than most whiskeys. Now, the father of uh, American of Canadian whiskey was this guy, Howard Walker, uh, who made it in 1858, and I love the story behind this. Walker was a Detroit businessman, and he looked across the river and said, hmm, I can move to Canada and I can do what I'm doing here in Detroit cheaper and with less regulation. In fact, there's a lot of whiskey regulations from the 1800s still in the books today. So he moved his operation, locked shop and barrel, went over to Canada and started doing the same thing he was doing in America except at a lower cost, which means he could charge less and still make more money. And to make it sound highfalutin fancy, he called it club whiskey. And it did fantastically well. Well, then the Canadian distillers got upset. They wait a second, this is not the Americans said, this ain't fair. So they had a law passed that made it where it became he had to put Canadian on it. So they called it Canadian Club, but it made it sound even fancier and more posh. When the Civil War came, he made a fortune because of dollar devalue, so he hired every boat he could find in, in around Canada, took jugs of his whiskey to Detroit and sold them for a fantastic profit. In fact people claim that he had a pipeline going underneath the from his distillery to Detroit, which wasn't true. Okay, Irish whiskey has to be produced in Ireland, it goes through a triple distillation process, and of course, aged to be single malted or blended. Uh, in the 1860s, Irish whiskey was the most popular whiskey in America because it was cheap and because there were so many Irish immigrants. Um, and I presume that it would probably have been popular in the Old West too because you had so many Irish railroad workers. Um, old Bush Mills, 
It's one of the oldest distilleries in the world. They date back to the 1600s. You can still buy their products today. The most popular in America today is Jameson's, which was around at that time. Although John Jameson, the founder, was actually Scottish. I always loved that. <laughs> Moonshine. Woohoo! Okay. Moonshine, the term, by the way, is Scottish in origin. Uh, it, it was, moonshine was a 17th term in the 1700s. Like we say, we got sunshine out today. We, they would say, oh, there's moonshine out for me, like the light of the moon. Um, it's clear, unaged whiskey. It's made primarily with corn. The bri barley and rye are used sometimes. In recent years, sugar has been added to its production, which has actually been a boom to the ATF because if they think there's some illegal moonshine going on in the area, they will go to your, you know, scope out the Costco's and the Sam's Club, and if people are buying huge amounts of sugar for no apparent reason, they say, hmm, moonshiner. Um, you can make a thousand gallons of wheat, which is six thousand dollars for its owner, and so farmers make moonshine because they can make ten times more money from liquid corn than by selling corn as food. Now, moonshine in of itself, contrary to popular belief, is not illegal. What makes it illegal is the failure to get the proper license, permits, pay your proper fees, taxes, etc. etc. If you do that, you can make all the moonshine you want to your den back go up high eighty five. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of places that are making legal moonshine now. Illegal moonshine, you've got to be very careful because like I said earlier, copper is used in station for process. But these people they will use sheet metal, tin foil, I mean you can find all kinds of poisonous metal. They can be poisoned and drink, and they often just find dead animals in it, too, so yeah. fire beware, if ever. Okay, rye whiskey, which is one of the oldest in America, started in Pennsylvania. 51% uh, rye, the other 49% is corn and barley. Mm -hmm. Again, you chart oak barrels. Um, very popular in the Northeast United States throughout the 19th century, and Pennsylvania, Maryland. Um, as said, it was fan Grant was fan of old overholt or some people called it Old Overcoat, uh, which is the oldest continuous um, brand of whiskey in America. Um, they, during Prohibition, they got permitted to do, um, because they had connections with Washington, to do medicinal whiskey, so they've never stopped being in, pro in production. Doc Holliday was a fan of it, Johnny Ringo was a fan of it, and JFK was a fan of it, too. Um, rye whiskey, though, fell out of favor after World War II. In the 1960s, you start seeing a uh, huge, you know, brown liquors went out, you know, style, white liquors, rum, tequila, um, gin became popular, and rye whiskey really suffered. It's only now starting to make a comeback, but it's very, very much a niche market. Scotch. Okay. Um, 2017, more Scotch whiskey is sold internationally than all American, Canadian, and Irish whiskeys combined. Because of its high price, only the wealthy elite could afford it in the 1800s, but by the 1870s it started to get popular, but I suspect most of the popularity was on the East Coast. Uh, see, the only people who drank in the West would have been like the rich barons, the uh, mine barons, the railroad barons, etc., etc. Okay. Go next. Okay, yeah, you got single malt, which was the most popular in America in the 19th century, and then blended, which is probably the most popular today. I uh, read an article years ago about blended whiskey, and a good quality blended whiskey can contain up to three or four dozen different whiskeys in it. Um, and it was in, the, the master blender was talking about how in his laboratory he had like vials of 84 different whiskeys because you know, some years, you know, they have a set formula, but one distiller cannot necessarily meet their quota or the flavor's off, so he's got to remix the formula to keep the consistency up. And interestingly enough, he said that he did not use his tongue, he used his nose. He said the nose was more sensitive than his tongue. <laughs> so, kind of interesting. It's a, sounds like a fun job, but apparently it's a very tough job to do, and you got years and years of training. All right, Tennessee whiskey which is actually the youngest of all American whiskeys, believe it or not. <laughs> and it's basically bourbon with the extra step of filtering the liquid through charcoal, like that, and new char oak barrels. Now, unlike bourbon, where you can make it anywhere in the country, Tennessee whiskey can only be made in Tennessee. 
although you could perhaps skirt that wall by saying Hennessy style whiskey. And Brunson says say it creates a smoother whiskey. The inventor of this style of this is credited to this man, Jasper Newton Jack Daniels, or Uncle Jack, as a lot of people in college call him. <laughs> and of course, you know, most probably one of the most iconic brands, American brands of all, Michael Anthony of um, you know Van Halen. He had a bass guitar on which the Jack Daniels label was was the base of it. Um, very popular, of course. What more can we say? If you don't drink bourbon, you know Jack Daniels. So we talk a lot about new chart oak barrels. Where do they go after being used? Because by the U.S. law, they can only be used once. A lot of them go to Scotland, where they're used to age scotch, or they become charcoal. <laughs> and by the way, my stock tip for the day, invest in new charred oak barrels. Yes. All right. Sutler or Frontier Whiskey. Um, this is from one of my favorite films, um, the John Wayne for Apache. And I could not find a picture of it, but afterwards, they go into his warehouse, the Sutler's Warehouse, Indian Asian, and they find a case marked Bible. They open the case and there are two small kegs. And Henry Fonda says, for me some scripture. He takes a sip, spits it out, puts a match to it, and it goes whoosh. <laughs> All right, so now for a disclaimer, this is for fun and entertainment. Do not try any of this at home. Frontier Settler whiskeys were sold by unscrupulous Settler Saloon. Now, if you were lucky, it would just simply be wired down. There was actually a term for this called cut. Um, but the ingredients in this can include 140 proof green alcohol, burnt sugar, ether, peppers, almonds, I don't call that almond joy, tea for coloring, and the real stuff for flavoring. Now, the proliferation of cheap whiskeys gave birth to the modern cocktail as consumers look for ways to hide the bad taste. Um, in fact, cocktails really did not become popular in Europe until the 20th century. Um, they're pretty much an American invention in some European towns. She'll look down upon them for that. Uh, mm. And then you have this one, whiskey recipe. Do take, not try this at home or anywhere else, please. Yeah. Take one oil, take oil of vitriol, sulfuric acid, one quart, strict nine, one gallon, and spirits of turpentine, 24 gallons. Whew, that's a lot of gallons. Mix with rainwater and allow it to sell for three <laughs> days. I don't think you can set this oh. for three years if it still wouldn't be drinkable. Yeah. And they'll be ready for use. The article adds greatly the combativeness of the drinker can be given with advantage to qualms from militiamen who can't exactly make up their minds to go to war, but who boast loud of the intention of doing so. <laughs> yeah, how do you survive that? Now, a couple of things you notice I did not talk about. Gin, which did not become popular in this country until about the turn of the last century. Vodka, which did not become popular in this country until after World War II. And tequila, which we could not be legally imported to the United States until the 1880s. So that was probably along the U.S. Mexican border, there was probably some places that sold cactus juice. All right. Now the problem is with all this is that you had, a, you know, alcohol. You're alone. Either soldiers got drunk. I mean, that was one of the problems that faced a lot of U.S. Army soldiers, and of course. And then you also had a lot of veterans of the Civil War who were out west who had, you know, injuries both visible and hidden um, that they self medicated with, you know, alcohol. Um, people think substance abuse is something that created, you know, after Vietnam or the recent Asian War. It's been there all along. We just didn't really recognize it or call it. So all this helped led to the um, prohibition movement. And so basically, we had a new war between the dries and the wets. Uh, which of course ended with you know prohibition, which later of course was repealed, and still to the day you still have a little bit of that. But that pretty much kind of sums up what it was like in the West. You got some examples if you ever wanted to do a tasting party, or you, there are some good ideas for you. <laughs> Wish if you had some free samples, but I don't think Alan would have liked it if I did. Thank you, Bob. You know, you're known for your research. Did you do a lot of research? Well, I worked at Greens actually for <laughs> several years. <laughs> no more joke. I really did. Personal research. Yeah, yeah, and I'm also of Scottish and Irish ancestry, so that that yeah, that those two things I think qualifies me. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, I will say one thing: if you ever want a good laugh, go to a liquor store like Greens, a big one, or a lot. And look 
at the scotch section and read the origin stories of these scotches. Um, oh, they'll yeah. say, and some king something something, the third, fifth earl of this and that, gave in gratitude to someone, gave scotch recipe, or it was a wedding gift, or all these, and you kind of go like, yeah, right, dude. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, so yeah, that, and it's all, they're always great for a good laugh. Um, Scotch, I should also add to, also became popular during Prohibition um, because it was so easy to smuggle Scotch and Irish whiskey uh, from to the United States. I mean, if you look at a globe, you know, there's almost a direct line between them and Boston and New York, and of course the Kennedy family. That's how they made their money. So. But anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, beer served always in Western Salute before refrigeration. Um. Yeah. Well. They were, as I said, beer had a short shelf life, but which is why Anheuser Busch, you know, came up with the ice house system. Um, there were some places where you could, honestly, if you were in the Rocky Mountains, um, trying to, you know, free trade would not be that difficult because, you know, even in the summertime, I can tell from personal experience, it gets really cold at night. So there was some that, but then again, too, it was sort of fire beware, but also. A lot of places too, um, even though you did have the national brands like Coors, Schlitz, and Budweiser, um, a lot of saloon owners made their own beer. You had local saloon owners. In fact, when I was looking at the um, business directory for Columbia on the eve of the Civil War, I found like there were three, I think three breweries here in the city mm -hmm. at the time. So, so you had that a lot. I mean, you know, the concept of the national brewery is really post-prohibition. Uh, now, of course, now you're starting to see a little bit of turn back, you know, of that too. I mean, here in Columbia, we got, I think we now got more breweries here than we did before the Civil War. And good ones, too, I might add. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. This is kind of peripheral, but do you remember when, because it's not that long ago that the British Navy ended its rum run? Yeah, on um, the British, yeah, I can't talk about rum. Uh, rum was popular in the coastal towns, but, but not in the West, but um, the British Navy ended in the 70s. Um, in 1970s? I want to say 73 or 74. Now, the last Navy to get rid of it was New Zealand. They got rid of it in the 1990s. Now, the United States gave them rations, um, um, stopped doing the rations before the Civil War. And in England, um, you know, talk about the Prohibition Movement here in England, you know, the British military was looked upon as the biggest cause of alcoholism. Because not only the soldiers got wrong, if you were being stationed in India and you were an officer, you got wine rations or gin. You know, gin time was actually used to treat prevent malaria because some of water had quinine in it. Or, and then of course IPAs, which are now the rage, were given to the soldiers. They were fresh, especially designed to survive a long trip to India and for the heat. And the I stands for depending on who you talk to, import pale ale. Indian Pale L or Imperial Pale L. Personally, I don't care much of those. Yeah, but the rum ration was considered part of British service pay. Yeah. I mean, it was in contract, wasn't it? I mean, that yeah, it was. Yeah, and it, about noon, uh, about noon every day is when they would stop to have the ration, the rum ration. And, and of course, the officers on board British ships, and American ships for that matter, too, they would also drink brandy and fortified wines like Port Madeira. And um, Sherry. So who's thirsty now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, who was responsible for promulgating all the rules and regulations of, about what different liquors could be? It seems like a very arcane. Yeah, it's it, difficult to legislate. Yeah, it, it's just, it's really about two centuries where you can't go all the way back to the Whiskey Rebellion, you know, when George Washington had to personally put down, put on uniform. Put down. I mean, from that point on, you know, the liquor industry will argue with some justification that it's the most regulated industry in America. I said there's a lot of 19th century laws that are still in the books to this day that are still in force, um, and I don't really see any change in that happening. But yeah, it's really sort of an archaic system. And of course, one of the things too that makes it even more archaic is like the how the sale regulation is left to each individual state. Here in South Carolina, for example, you know, liquor stores are privately owned, so you're only limited to having three of them. In North Carolina, um, all liquor stores are all state-owned and operated. So that's what we did, you know, with the state dispensary, you know, 
Yeah, I, this for Ben. So and and then you got some states where you can buy liquor in the grocery store. Yeah, when I went to Iowa, they they actually have rows of liquor in the grocery store. I about fell over when I saw that. Yeah, CVS actually CVS is a drugstore chain actually makes its own vodka, which they sell in some stores across the country. Believe it or not, I've never tried it. I'm not sure. Drugstore vodka, what could possibly go wrong? Um, about as much as <laughs> it could go wrong with um, gas station sushi, but <laughs> I digress. Have you, have, you alcohol too, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. have you thought about doing something? I just, some Joe was interested, I know, to talk about Tillman and the dispensary yeah. system mm -hmm. and the and yeah, all I the violence was so Yeah, I wrote, I wrote a piece of that for Bluefish Digest several years ago. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, um, the state of South Carolina was about on the verge of about that close to passing its own prohibition. And then for some reason, Pittsburgh Ben Tillman, who oddly enough did not drink, if there's anybody who I thought would drink, it would be him. <laughs> but then the Tillmans make money. They well, what he, you know, what he did is he came up with a system. The distillery system was basically South Carolina would buy liquor wholesale. And if you would not know which brand you're buying, you would know by the quality. It'd be like A, B, C, D, which means that, okay, you want bourbon. You go into the distillery on Monday, you could get Jim Bean. You go on Friday, you might get Jack Daniels. And you're also limited to how much you could buy. And to say that kickbacks and bribes happen a lot, I mean, the legislature, I think, said that, I want to say that like $1.4 million in graft from the system, I mean. Oh, so in family too, mm -hmm. he, he, he saw the contracts, didn't he? He was disperse them to political friends and all that. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, I mean, it was just right with the uh, corruption people. The one good scene that came out of it are the bottles. You know, the bottles are absolutely gorgeous. I would love to have one myself. But yeah, it was it was just a chaotic system. You had a riot in Darlington where the um, people where I think someone was killed and they had to call up the state militia to quell it um, because people were attacked to the distillery and all that dispensary and so forth. So, yeah, it was crazy. You know, Pittsburgh Penn Tillman, actually, that's not even the craziest Pittsburgh Penn Tillman story I know. The craziest one, though, is that he wanted to run president. So he made a speech at the Democratic National Convention and it was so bad, so poorly received, he used a lot of profanity. That the crowd started drowning, booing him loudly. Fans started playing to drown in and out. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. the, and the net result is that William Jennings Bryan got the nomination, and the only state that supported uh, Tillman was South Carolina. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, yeah. And that monument is a big house. I mean, that one can't take down monuments, but I've always thought it was the ugliest monument in the state house. Oh, you know who was the keynote speaker in this dedication? What? You know who was the keynote speaker? Yeah. James F. Burns. Burns was? Burns was, yeah. Burns was still the night. And now his monument is still facing it. Anybody else see any other questions? How much yeah. alcohol is there in one shot? It varies. Um, the high fruit. Yeah, it's usually high fruit. Well, I say moonshine, you know, thing about the charred oak barrels is that it gives whiskey its color and as in some cases flavor. Um, but moonshine is usually high proof. Um, it's probably comparable to green alcohol. Um, oh, yeah. It would be very close to it. I mean, I think you I've you need to try apple pie moonshine if you like apples. I, I want to say it I, is amazing and addictive. I but don't drive. <laughs> I think